Eric, thank you very much for agreeing to be interviewed. Happy to do it. Uh, and the theme of this interview is sort of the state of the union of domain-driven design now, or rather this. So since the time the book was published, how do you see the uh, state of the art in domain-driven design change? Well, I think I could answer that a number of ways, and uh, I suppose that that would include things that I've learned since then, things that I've changed about the way I do domain-driven design. I think, though, that the biggest change, of course, is that now a uh, fair number of people are familiar with the patterns of domain-driven design and the basic concepts of it. And so uh, it's much more of a situation where people are actually trying to apply it and, uh, you know, using those patterns as opposed to always going into a place and introducing it completely fresh. And then the third thing is that now there's a community of DDD experts out there that are generating new innovations and insights, which is uh, quite exciting. Okay, so I guess the first thing I'm personally interested in is the community and how you think it's evolving. And the things that I wanted to ask was first, so DDD sort of has grown its own legs and now and not just one pair but many. And there are a lot of people that uh, work in the area and they're discovering new things and they're interpreting it in certain ways. And I would think that sometimes their interpretations or their results may clash with what <laughs> you initially said. Yes, so, well, of course, I don't always agree with everything. I mean, I'm a member of the community, too, and I have my opinions. Uh, the only thing that I really try to m sort of maintain is a consistent set of definitions. I think that that's the thing that that's the glue. So if we use our terms in essentially the same way, uh, I wouldn't want someone to redefine context map or bounded context. But uh, someone who wanted to use it a different way or that, that would, that's a great innovation. I think we need, a, uh, though, our, our common language. And uh, so far, so good on that, I think. In fact, I think a lot of the people who come to DDD, they, they value that language. They say, well, this is always the way I liked to do my software, uh, but now I've got a way to talk about it. Okay, so now the community itself has been growing. What was your, what has been your experience with watching the community grow? I mean, is it growing fast enough? Is it the adoption going fast enough? Is it uniform enough across the ge various geographic locations, the various countries? Well, I won't try to answer that in a really uh, objective way because well, I just don't way. have the data. I'll say that subjectively it seems to me that it has slowly but steadily picked up, uh, picked up momentum over the last five years. Uh, I kind of noticed a couple of points, I think, at which there's sort of a noticeable jump. The first was maybe two years after the book was out, and suddenly it seemed like there were other people writing about DDD other than me. Now, I know there were people who blogged about it and so on, but I mean, there were, there were books about it, conference presentations about it. So we, at that point, started to get our first crop of, of people who had had time to try it out for a couple of years, decide what they thought of it, and then go and, and start talking about their own experiences. And then, uh, not that we didn't have that before in the form of people who had done it, who had used it before the book, but mm -hmm. without the name, without the patterns, without the, the, the terminology in a consistent form. Then, just the last year or so, it seems like there's been another little bump. And uh, in this case, we have, now we have enough uh, people to fill whole tracks of speakers at conferences and a lot of interest in what those people have to say. 
but my impressions are so, so, you know, I just see things through a little lens. I also know that geographically, there's no question that in the first couple of years, the focus of attention on DDD was Scandinavia. Um, I had clients and uh, there was a lot of interest uh, in terms of conferences and so forth. Initially in Norway, Sweden, then in Denmark, a little bit in other places, of course, some in North America and some in the rest of Europe. But the big, uh, totally out of proportion to population interest was Scandinavia. But lately that's uh, been spreading. I've noticed a considerably uh, larger amount of uh, interest in the U.S. And uh, I think London has become a kind of center of DDD activity. So, uh, and, and I know there's uh, activity elsewhere too. I know people in Brazil, uh, and uh, I know that there's some interest in China because they translated the book. Some of these areas, of course, are not as connected to the rest of the community, probably because of language factors. But, uh, yeah, it's out there. Uh, but, of course, I have no idea what numbers are like. Well, uh, and of course, there are a few users groups now. I mean, the New York users group that you're leading, and uh, there's one in Sweden, and uh, there's one in London. So, yeah, there's a lot of activity out there. All right, so then what is your focus? I suppose that uh, there are probably two or three things I'm focused on, in addition to my current clients, uh, which, of course, uh, that's, <laughs> that's actually, you know, my day job is, is uh, working with uh, my uh, consulting clients. But one uh, business initiative that is also, I think, really crucial to the growth of DDD is uh, the establishment of uh, public open enrollment classes. Mm -hmm. We've uh, offered classes internally for companies f since the beginning, one of our basic businesses. But I think in order for a thing like DDD to get outside a certain box, people need various steps along the way. So they can uh, maybe uh, watch some videos on uh, the internet as a very sort of low threshold easy step, and then, you know, getting the book and maybe reading part of it is a little bit of a bigger step. Reading the whole thing is a pretty big step. A lot of people prefer to learn in a classroom, and so an important step is to have classes available for people to enroll in, and uh, not, but not with the commitment that it takes to get them brought into your company and train your whole team. So... <clears throat> Uh, we've uh, been developing a partnership with someone. There's a company in uh, Sweden called Ceteris that's now doing our training courses uh, on a regular basis in Sweden. Uh, we've made a partnership with Skills Matter in London. Mm -hmm. They're going to do the classes in the UK and a couple of other countries. And uh, we are uh, looking to do the same in the U.S. And I think this will provide an important step where people can go and learn some more with a kind of moderate level of commitment. Speaking of learning, people who are uh, really missing and needing a sample application, the DDD sample application, and these people from Ceteris actually did it. That's right. That is actually something that I've been involved with. And uh, now, you know, the purpose of this application is not to be a perfect example. It's, uh, you know, there are compromises, first of all, that have to be made with current technology, but also um, these are people who are doing this, and uh, we'll, we're going to uh, review it and make it hopefully better and better. But, uh, yeah, I think that people have asked from the very beginning for a working sample that they could uh, study and see how we put all the pieces together. Uh, 
although I have emphasized over the years that the building block patterns are not the core of DDD, that they're a sort of secondary thing, secondary to things like ubiquitous language, contexts, and learning to explore the domain with domain experts and so forth. But they are an essential part. I mean, you do need, ultimately, to be able to uh, express your model in software. And so people, you know, it isn't obvious how you make a repository actually work using, let's say, Hibernate and Spring, or how you actually make value objects persist in a database, which is not made easy by the frameworks that currently exist. And so uh, the sample app's purpose is to demonstrate one way of doing that. And then its secondary purpose is to uh, provide a kind of platform to test new ideas about how to do it. So if, uh, let's say, we made a, a very a, a different version of the sample app that uh, used Greg Young's approach, where everything is streams of events and commands flowing around, and uh, and state changes are all explicitly modeled. Well, I think that would be a good, you know, a nice thing to have that that fully implemented, the same functionality, same con conceptual model with minor variations, uh, and people could look at it side by side and see what the impact really is. Likewise, someone proposes a new framework. Uh, Ricard Oberg uh, right now is uh, starting to roll out a new framework called Chi for J. And OK, is Chi for J good for DDD or not? Well, I don't want to have to answer that question by just looking at a framework and imagining. Like the empirical e evidence would probably be more. Yeah, and useful. even though the kind of evidence it really takes probably is use on some real projects. pilot projects, real projects. But short of that, um, Ricard is actually implementing a version of this sample app. I don't know how it will turn out. Uh, he's not finished doing that. But I think it's great because now we can look at, you know, well, this is what it looks like with Spring and Hibernate, and this is what it looks like with Ricard's uh, framework. And we can see if we really like the way it works. And I think it'll also help people understand how to apply that framework. Uh, so this sample app is going to be an important thing, I believe. It's still early days. I don't want people to ex uh, you know, get uh, to uh, expect too much. Uh, well, I mean, I've seen the presentation. Peter Backlund flew to New York and presented it to our group. Yep. Very kind of him. And so it was in a fairly good state. It was interesting. The presentation was interesting, and the application was interesting to look at. Yeah, Very and informative. the feedback from groups like yours uh, is being taken in and Peter uh, who's done you know a great job getting it to this point and now he's taking the feedback and improving it and uh, you know I'm I've done the same looked at it and given some feedback and so uh, yeah I think that uh, in an, over the next several months this thing will get into a shape where it, it can really fulfill its purpose. Okay. Um, cutting edge. What is the cutting edge of domain-driven design today? Now, on one hand, DDD is not the sort of thing that has a cutting edge. Mm. I think that in some ways, it's a sort of fundamental. That is, it. it's just a, a, a whole, it's an approach to software where we focus on the domain. And then all the rest sort of unfolds from that basic premise. But yes, I mean, actually how to do that. And, and clearly this, this stuff, you know, as I said before, this stuff that Greg Young's doing is, is cutting edge. I think that uh, the, there's a certain bubbling now of people who, who build frameworks that actually are trying to directly enable DDD. I mentioned Ricardo Olberg's uh, Chief for J. 
I'm not saying that it will work. I right. think it's too early for me to say that. I'm just saying that it's interesting that people are starting to try to build frameworks that actually assist you in doing this, whereas before we've always sort of had to fight the frameworks a little bit. It would be actually interesting to see uh, a language that specifically supports domain-driven design, with domain-driven design cons constructs built in. That would be interesting, but I think we're a little ways from that. I know. And maybe that's just as well, because uh, the first few approaches to doing something like this are probably going to uh, miss the target a little bit. You know, the, we'll learn from those, and, and frameworks, uh, though they aren't as elegant a solution as building into the language, but they do change faster than languages True. do. <clears throat> so uh, if we had frameworks that were trying to accommodate us, and those were rapidly changing for a few years in response to discovering what worked and didn't work, then, who knows, yeah, maybe in a few years uh, the th we would know enough to say what would really be a good language feature. Of course, it could kind of trickle in. Right. Already uh, in, uh, in C-sharp, there are ways of, of uh, making an object more like a value object than was previously possible. Uh, so there are... I think that, that we're inching in that direction, perhaps. Uh, people are becoming more and more interested in domain-specific languages. How do you think it will play with... Uh, I mean, how, how is it going to help with applying domain-driven design? In principle, domain-specific languages would help a lot with domain-driven design because the ubiquitous language which is the language that we speak with each other and the language that we want to speak with our business people as well, all based on this model. And we want our code to echo that language. If you're writing Java code, you can craft Java code sometimes into a shape where, by inspection, it has an obvious relationship to this language. So... But the thing about a domain-specific language is that it could make that correspondence even closer, much closer, possibly. So, uh, now by this, I, I, you know that I'm not a believer in end users or, or in oh, yeah. business people writing software. But that's very different from business people reading software. And I think that the ideal would be something like a domain-specific language and that evolved on a project and that would allow, allow a, a business person to actually read the program and tell you whether he thought it was right or not, or discuss it with you. Not write it, read it. However, uh, this is something that... This is a potential that has not yet been realized. One of the interesting things, of course, you know, Martin Fowler has been intensely interested in this for the last few years, and he's started breaking it down and kind of identified two distinct types of DSLs. The type that I think is pretty much already here and the which could... Hmm? Internal. The internal DSLs. I think those have potential for sure. Because basically, uh, we've done this. We've been doing this for a long time. It was part of the small talk culture. And I think that the internal DSL is basically what I was thinking of when I originally wrote uh, the ubiquitous language pattern and was thinking of expressing the model in the, in the code. But um, the... Uh, and I think that you could go further with that. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the techniques that Martin's been collecting and refining and, and organizing uh, are nice. And uh, then there's the question of the external DSLs. 
And that's more technology dependent and it, um, I think it may turn out for at least for the foreseeable future that that is more applicable to specialty areas where you have a distinct separation between the people who are developing the software and the people who are kind of wiring it together in some way or other. That, that application I've seen work um, and that's been around for a long time without the level of sophistication that somebody to use a DSL in development of a business application uh, to use an external DSL in development of business application I think that's the area that has the big question mark the, the one thing that I have observed about most of the existing approaches is that the it's like a, a one a, a, there's one level where below this is whatever language or tools you use to construct the language and then above here is just other stuff that uses the language but that's not the way a ubiquitous language really works the ubiquitous language has terms that are like low level terms and then there are other terms language terms that are defined using those lower level ones and uh, without that basic ability to build abstractions on abstractions which Java allows you to do C sharp any object oriented programming language allows you to in effect build abstractions out of other abstractions also so that is taken away by the external DSLs that I've seen so far and so I think that's the most limiting thing of course it's also hard to change them, hard to change the language and then you know ripple that through to all the things that are using the language. But that could be solved with tools, the equivalent of refactoring tools but for DSLs and I'm sure there are people out there working on that sort of thing. But this lack of the ability to refine the abstractions and formulate new ones out of old ones, I really think that's very limiting. But uh, I guess that in these next few years that we're going to see a lot of experimentation in that area. Of course, I, I've found DSLs to be intriguing for a long time. Just because it hasn't worked out in all this time doesn't mean it won't work. Uh, but it's reason not to hold your breath, I think. Uh, I wouldn't... I wouldn't advise people to be the first adopter of some new DSL platform. But I think it's something to keep an eye on. Uh, okay, so now the future. The future, what, how do you see the how do you see domain driven design evolve in the you know, next five years? And the framing of this question is you wrote the book and then there is a jump from that to today and we see how there is significant adoption of this and there's certain new trends that show up well if you could just speculate and extrapolate that to the next five years maybe thinking about this adoption with our seven nine year cycles that it takes to people for people to for, for it to become mainstream basically do you envision it being a mainstream I don't know. I suppose that uh, in the next five years it's inevitable that there will be things called domain-driven design that have nothing to do with domain-driven design, but that's probably use the same <laughs> words but in different ways. Uh, that's certainly happened to Agile. But of course uh, there's also been tremendous growth of Agile in terms of people who really do Agile as well. Um, that probably happened with object orientation too. Oh yes. Oh yes, I mean it's been noted that you can write COBOL code in any language, <laughs> and uh, so. But I think that the one thing is that apart from the sort of fundamental orientation of saying that we are focused on that underlying domain, understanding it, collaborating with the experts in that domain to refine models. Mm -hmm 
and then building our software based on that. Other than that, uh, domain-driven design is not, I think, a static thing. For example, uh, when I wrote the book, I described sort of three uh, building blocks that uh, were the things you expressed your concepts with. Entities, value objects, and services, domain services, as distinct from application services. And then um, the factories and repositories as building blocks for give you access and so forth. In the last few years, I've come to use another building block, which, and that is to, uh, that is what I'm calling domain events. Uh, Martin Fowler has written up a pattern called Domain Event uh, that you can find on his website. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one of those things that's been around for a long time. But um, I think that it, it, you know, it really belongs as a peer with entities, value objects, and domain services, and domain events. Uh, domain event is just when something happens in the actual domain, not a system event, an actual <clears throat> event that happens in the domain that needs to be recorded and responded to in the software, and a representation of what happened. And uh, that's all there is to a domain event, but it's really valuable. And um, I think it's also closely related to this approach that uh, Greg Young likes to use, right. where different uh, highly decoupled uh, subsystems are communicating only by event streams. Uh, he adds a few more pieces to it, like explicitly um, modeling state changes, which some of which are domain events and some of which I think are not. Um, so there could be something in that area, I think, that to really hash that out. And of course, we're moving to different architectures, you know, all this grid computing, cloud computing, right. all of that sort of thing is going to drive us to shift our modeling a little bit to emphasize different things. One of the patterns uh, that I always thought was one of the most important patterns, probably more important than entity value distinction and all of that, is aggregates. I think aggregates are going to be very important when we start these extreme distribution approaches, you know, uh, grid computing and cloud computing and all of that. I think that, yeah, so um, I suppose that the importance of certain patterns will rise and others will decline, um, events and uh, aggregates being the two that I can think of right now. Also, I haven't, I wouldn't say that uh, the, any of the uh, I wouldn't say that any of the strategic patterns have changed in my mind, but I think I've gotten better at explaining them, a lot better at explaining them. So hopefully that will help some with adoption of those. I think that there are, those are actually not complex, but elusive concepts that uh, are difficult to explain. And I think that in chapters 14 and 15 of my book, I explain them reasonably well, but I'm better at explaining them now. I've been to your presentation yesterday, and uh, I can agree to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was, uh, that was probably something that I wouldn't have been bold enough to say five years ago. <laughs> Talking about books, are you thinking about uh, publishing another one or a revision of this one, given the experience that you, the insights that you've gained over the years? Well, we all think about all sorts of things, but and so naturally I've thought about this, but I don't have any concrete plans right now. It's just too much work to do right now. I need to focus on uh, business for a, a while, and uh, but. I'll, I'm planning to try to undertake something more lightweight, write a few papers, or uh, or maybe start a blog, but I'm not promising anything. <laughs> well, all right. Thank you very much, Eric. 
Thank you. It's been a pleasure.